Okay, hi. So uh, this is Jean Chandler once again, uh, broadcasting from the steamy jungles of Northern Caribbean, aka Southern United States and New Orleans. And I have the great pleasure today to speak to Machik Talaga. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Hello. And uh, so Machik is a, uh, a fencer involved in what we call the HEMA, or Historical European Martial Arts Community, and uh, uh, also a, a professor of history uh, who, with a special focus on the fight books, and in particular one, one of the most interesting, I think, of that corpus. Well, it's actually archaeology. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Archaeology. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, both are study. Well, both are about the past, right? But uh, yeah, people sometimes get killed here for mistaking <laughs> these things. Yeah, no, yeah I'm just no, joking. That's a, but that's a, that's a uh, there's standing beef, beef. I've actually you know, between uh, archaeologists and historians. I kind of have a that that makes sense because I kind of have a running joke that um, uh, archaeologists are always embarrassing historians you know it's like several uh several several period i mean i consider myself an amateur or wannabe historian because i rely on literature and I, I don't really look as much at the material culture but i try it when i can but you know i'm not out there digging uh but i've certainly mm -hmm. followed many really interesting episodes where uh historians were absolutely certain about something and and even the people who really were the most qualified like one of the examples of this is with the you know, Iceland and, and their at their their attitudes about the uh, the sagas from Iceland, the, the the Norse sagas, and they really wanted them to be uh, literature. They didn't want them to correlate too much with historical facts. And so when they when they found mm -hmm. facts that that verified, for example, the the settlement in Newfoundland, uh, it, it right. created a big problem. <laughs> So okay, an ar archaeologist. Right, right. So an ex archaeologist with it with uh, a knack for experimental archaeology. So that's that's kind of what you were doing there, right? Yeah. That's something that maybe be... uh, once we get through introducing you here, uh, we can discuss a little bit because the taxonomy of how historical fencing is studied, I think, is 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 a bit odd here in certain places. And on the history side, I think uh, I find mm -hmm. it a bit confusing. Uh, but yeah, so I'd like to just have you introduce yourself. Uh, so that uh, people, the, the, the handful of people that, that uh, uh, watch my videos will have some exposure to your ideas and to your research and your journey and um, what you know, some of your uh, perceptions are of, of many of these issues that we're all interested in. So tell us a little bit like wh when you first uh, got exposed to historical fencing and, uh, and when you started veering in that direction for your degree. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that's the story I like to tell. Uh, not only because of nostalgia, but uh, well, I think it sort of um, serves as a mirror showing how the the Hima community evolved in Poland, where I'm based. Uh, so yeah, basically, as a, as a young fellow, I was actually I was up in a in a neighborhood a community where there were sport was largely synonymous with football and I was generally actually ignorant of the fact that there are other disciplines that you could pursue as a sportsman or as a you know amateur athlete so I, I was just a goalkeeper but that changed when I was in uh, high school meaning being like 14, 15, 16 and well 18 years old uh, in Poland and, and when, there, I'm sorry, when, I, when was this exactly when you were in high school? What year would that be? Well, the, the important thing happened in 2004 when I uh, met guys at my school who were um, participating in a historical reenactment. So they had this group where they tried to, like, you know, make replica clothing from the late Middle Ages, especially the the time around the Battle of Grunwald, which is, well, a major event in Polish history, much celebrated, and it has a large reenactment community already had back in the day, and now, of course, it grew exponentially. Uh, so I, I got hooked there, but I was, I, well, frankly, I wasn't very much interested in all the, well, the, the replica thing uh recreating personas or 
yeah. or or the clothing or whatever. I was there because they uh, had also uh, like sword fighting trainings. I just wanted to bash people in the head with with something. Yeah, <laughs> uh, probably because because I had some issues to resolve this way as, I mean, a, as a teenager. A lot of us do, especially when you're when you're young, right? That's that's a thing. I guess I guess so. Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't unique in that. I was no exception. Yeah. So. Uh, I would sit through their thing uh, where they would like, you know, prepare these things a little bored. And then I would like uh, have some fun um, during the trainings. And at some point in 2006, the, the leader of the group had discovered online that there's some called Arma. And uh, you, I think you're... Um, your audience is well familiar with the uh, with Arma. Yeah, hold that, that thought just a um, second. But... You're, you're breaking up slightly, so I'm going to just reiterate that for you. That he, he was referring to Arma right. Poland, which was the early uh, Arma was the early American HEMA group that expanded overseas pretty quickly, and uh, the right. the group in Poland became one of the more uh, important ones. Um, so yeah, continue, please. Yeah, but that took took time. At at that point, there was actually one, uh, you know, in the Arma, they had these hierarchy, these levels. You yeah. would be like a scholar first, then you would be um, an adept, I believe. And then you would achieve the rank of provost. Uh, and then you would be John Clemens, right? Uh, so this position was already <laughs> yeah, so no one was. <laughs> Actually, what happened then was uh, right. that light, lightning would hit you and you'd become part of a split and end up in another group. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, so uh, there were there were no adepts in Poland, uh, nor n n neither provosts. But we had a guy who well, got granted by John Clements with the title of senior researcher, and that was Bartłomiej Walczak. And he would start a study group in Poland first in Krakow, but then he moved to Warsaw, uh, and uh, he was. He was already a major force in the research side of things back in the day, not only in Poland, but he had like some some really important contributions elsewhere. Yeah, we know was him also... as Bart. Yeah, he's 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 quite yeah well, Bart. Well known. So that's yeah. exactly him. Yeah, and he he's still uh, he was still deeply into it, and still making making very important things, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, yeah, but back to two thousand and six. Of our group discovered the the arm pole site, uh, and he learned that Bart uh, is about to move to Warsaw and open the Warsaw study group, which has been operating for a while earlier, but then it was closed. It's not important. And the important thing is that the arm must. What, what what city were you were you starting in? In Warsaw. Yeah, that's Warsaw. Yeah. I, I forgot to tell you that. Yeah, so it was all happening in Warsaw. I was based in Warsaw, and to a large extent, I'm still based there. Uh, yeah, so he discovered that this Arma group is about to, to open. And after some discussion, we agreed that it would be best to like delegate all our sword fighting training to Arma trainings. Uh, so we decided we would abandon training on our own. And instead, we enrolled to the new group to be uh, trained by Bart Valachak. Uh, and this started in 2007, because we had to wait until the group actually opened. Uh, and after that, I actually uh, lost the connection with the reenactment group, because uh, they were now left with all the boring stuff and no fun at all. Uh, from my perspective, right, right. <laughs> so all the fun was in the Arma, so I moved there. But uh, most of my friends from the reactant group would also appear at those trainings, so uh, that was nice because I didn't have to like lose those friends because of yeah. the move. Right, so this this was my first and initial exposure to him being trained by Bart Valchak in the, the, the John Longsword, and I got booked enough to stay. And I stayed in uh, Arma Poland. Um, I have stayed throughout these years, and I'm still a member. I didn't realize uh, it was still and a I thing. Been... 
That's it. I, I had no idea. I thought it had broken up. Yeah, I mean, uh, we we had a turbulent story with um, the U.S. armadors, the original Arma, and at some point, uh, John Clemens basically kicked us out, but yeah. we just refused to acknowledge this. <laughs> so we decided that if he doesn't like Arma with us, then we'll remain Arma and he can do whatever he wants. Uh, so uh, oh, Arma yeah. Poland has become largely independent, I mean, entirely independent <laughs> so uh, in 2010. Well, this was, I, remember the, I remember the letter where he had had a dispute. He, was, he started feuding with Bart and then he, he was good. He, he cast so John Clemens was on very prominent, and, uh, and, uh, and for other people in the early proponent of historical <laughs> fencing based on the bite books, particularly the, the German uh, language books, and had had a following, and he would make making groups around the U.S. and in, okay. and in certain parts of Europe. I think the, in Greece was another big group, and uh, uh, he had a tendency to start to purge people out of his group as soon as they became prominent, or they if they disagreed with him ever on anything like. Uh, I was never in Arma, but I, I got uh, sort of thrown off the forum when I was trying to point out that in the movie The 300, Persians are not orcs. I, Persians, I've met some, they're people. <laughs> they're not orcs. <laughs> uh, right. But uh, right. anyway, so yeah, he, he, he decided to pick on Bart, and then um, you, you, I remember the, the Polish Hema fencers, who we were already getting a little glimpses of, and we're already having some indications were quite good. Uh, you know, rose to Bart's defense, and I assume you were part of that. Or it was actually Bart, because Bart resigned as uh, Arma Poland at some time before, and his successor was uh, Krzysztof Kruczyński, still a good friend of mine, and a great guy overall. Uh, yeah, and and uh, he um, he got targeted by John Clemens. He got threatened. And John generally like issued a challenge, uh, challenged him to a duel, yeah. and promised to like make short work of him and all, all you know, and added a, a lot of you know insults and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we decide okay, we'll make that work. So we wrote to John Clemens that we want to follow on his word, and we are willing to gather money for his. Plane tickets will arrange an event that will be, Christoph will be there, so they will, you know, be uh, able to uh, to do the fighting. And in the meantime, the, the, the uh, other fencers would, like, eagerly volunteer to fight next. So there was a long waiting list. I was, I, I, well, I added my name to the list pretty immediately, but I was already, like, I don't know, 30th on the list or something so there was quite a lot of people wanting yeah and to, I, to find I could him. say from the outside so the thing was that john uh you know was the, john talked of in louisiana we have a joke uh, that we say you know somebody's got a an alligator mouth but a guppy ass and uh <laughs> they, <laughs> this guy had an alligator mouth and uh, i had so i had an encounter with him too actually in 2004 i arranged an arm event in new orleans that uh kind of went awry because John uh, first he told me that I couldn't hang around with people that I knew that were we were sort of playing around with swords and then he so I kind of quit talking to him and then the people I had connected him with for the venue and the uh, hotel and everything he fell out with them there was a guy who's running a, a, a theater program for a, a local arts high school who liked th theatrical fencing and was gonna let them use this beautiful facility and John told the guy the guy's gonna let him use the facility for free. John told him, uh, you know, if you want to, we'll use your facility, but if you want to watch the event, you'll have to pay the fee, the full fee. Mm. And so the guy said, fuck off. And uh, so they contacted me three or four days before the event, and I had to find him a, a venue at the last minute, which ended up being a avant-garde theater in a, in a really dangerous ghetto neighborhood in New Orleans. <laughs> and anyway, that's another story. But so from the outside, a lot of people really wanted to see John show what he could really do outside of his own club right and and people mm -hmm. had already seen some glimpses of of some of the fencing coming out of poland that looked really good like people that were athletic and sharp and could fight and had been you know, a lot of people i think in the west and in the u.s people currently some of the people i met uh had you know 
uh, suburban backgrounds and sort of were upper middle class uh, folks that had never been in a fist fight, you know, and, and uh, whereas mm -hmm. I had a little bit more of a working class background that I was always struck by that. And it seemed like a lot of the guys in Eastern Europe had a little bit more uh, uh, good tempo and timing. And that kind of goes along with having been in a couple of scrapes, it seems like, you know, and anyway, so I think everybody was very eager to see what was going to happen when John went to Poland. Yeah. And uh, and so then what yeah. happens next? You, you tell that, and we'll, we'll so we'll we'll chime in. Right. Yeah. So we arranged everything, and we we booked a venue. Everything was ready. We were just waiting for John's final uh, confirmation to buy the plane tickets. The event was uh, scheduled for September 2010, and in August, oh, early in July. John stopped um, answering our mails, and in August it became obvious that he was not going to show up. And in September he finally answered and confirmed that he's not coming. So we decided to like redirect all the funds that we reserved for this, and it was a lot for us because most of us were students. We were poor as hell, <laughs> so doing this was like a major enterprise for us, a major effort. So we redirected these costs to change this event into the first um, the first ever Kima tournament in Poland. Oh, no, not the first ever. No, that, that would be wrong. One of the first tournaments, uh, Kima tournament in Poland. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it, it was a major milestone in the development of the community here. And that was the, we, that was W3? This, Yes, that was W3. That, yeah. The first W3 was born this way. And we we broke any ties with uh, with Arma. We were a little bit concerned with the copyright for the logo, this kind of stuff. But we, after some deliberation and some research on what actually, um, what was the actual status of these things in the US, we decided that we, we want better. <laughs> so we, we, we stayed Arma. And actually, this is this is my coffee mug the Arma logo and it has 2022 on it perhaps you can oh, yeah, see I gotta, it I gotta it's from the... from from the gathering so i mean we are we are still up and now that, and Ar now that well, i know but... Arma poland is a totally separate thing i i it's just even better and i think yeah it's entirely should, entirely independent you should invite him to uh to settle the the dispute with, uh, with a judicial combat so the, I have to say, though, the, the, the excuse that John gave had some merit, which was that he, at that exact same time, he got involved in this History Channel thing about Talhofer, and he went to Denmark for that, that and that was his excuse. Yeah, that him. was true. That was the excuse he actually uh, I think, from a search. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, that was a... That he, was a... <laughs> say again. Say he, again. He could have, I mean, noted... You can hear me? Yeah, it, it just broke up me? on and off. It broke up for a second. Right. Yeah, I, ju I just said like, it would be nice of him to, well, notify us a bit earlier. <laughs> or maybe allow us to rest, rest, rest schedule the thing. But he, he he wasn't willing to do any yeah, of I don't, this. Yeah, I don't blame him, man. He would have had some dents. I think the, the other thing that was funny was... Perhaps. Yeah, but I mean, I was actually really curious. Me too. Because Everybody I was. knew... From, from Bart and from Krzysztof, who met him, that he's actually a skilled fencer. So, yeah, it's a shame, because I think it would be a nice nice display. It could be, yeah, it could have been, but it's, it's, unfortunately it's just the thing with the thing with John's personality. But uh, I have seen John fence firsthand, because uh, I did this event uh, for them in New Orleans. And, right. Um, he, uh, he was a good fencer, especially for that period, but um, I don't think... Uh, I don't think he was going to, I saw like a video of the first, uh, or one of the early W3 event. I think it was like the 2012 one, but, uh, the speed and intensity there, uh, was notable. And, and it, we know that a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, American fencers have not, you know, gone over and conquered the, the tournaments in Poland, I don't think. And, uh, I also, um, you know, I have to comment just the fact that I remember on Scala Forum we were following all this on Matt, Matt Easton's forum back in those days, and mm -hmm. the way the the open letter that y'all wrote, uh, it had this wonderful combination of erudition, courtesy, 
had an ominous undertone. <laughs> reminded me of some <laughs> letters that, uh, you know, it was the kind of letter that you'd get from a Hanseatic League when you owed them money, you know. Uh, right, right, yeah. <laughs> that would be. Yeah, actually, actually, I think Bart is to 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 be credited for the word. Well, that's another. Uh, that's another Mart, reason to Mart, take my hat. Mart, to Bart. Mart Surdel, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was that was very uh, that was a very amusing episode. Okay, so by 2010, Arma Poland is independent, and and there's new other Polish groups are spreading around. I know that around that time yes. I was uh, talking to uh, a little bit to. Uh, Jan Czokiewicz up in, uh, in Gdansk and... I mean Jan, Jan Chodkiewicz, probably. Chodkiewicz, yeah. It's pronounced Chodke Chodkiewicz, right? Chodkiewicz. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they used to be an ARMA study group, but they broke um, away even before that that event that we've just discussed. Uh, yeah, and they since then they've been known as Factual Gdansk. Uh, yeah. Right, and that... that, that there, there have been other groups, some of them like post ARMA, others entirely independent with no history of any ARMA connection whatsoever. Uh, yeah, and nowadays, nowadays the, the scene is much richer with many new groups. Uh, right, so ARMA is now just one of them. Uh, some other groups like, emerge from ARMA Poland along the years, like peacefully this time. Yeah. Uh, right. So Arma is much smaller than it used to be in Poland now. So um, here you are in, in the early uh, 2010s and you've, you've got your own group right. and you're in your own independent group. And at what point um, did you verge into um, combining historical fencing with your archaeology uh, studies? Right. Yeah, that's the next, next thing to talk about. Yeah, because first, as I told you, I was interested in fighting, and I saw motivation for this. And I liked swords, like, just because, uh, with no, like, special anything about, about this. But that was good, and seven, I finished high school, and I enrolled at the uh, university. You enrolled uh, at university. Oh, and I started... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, and I started uh, archaeology studying archaeology at the University of Warsaw. And uh, there, my, my my first intention was to become, uh, well, a specialist in the Andean archaeology, like in South America, oh, like yeah. the Mayans, right? But it's it's termed Andean because of the, the mountain range of the Andean. I, I'm not sure if I pronounce yeah, the Andes, correctly. It, it, the that, Andes. Would be, that would be Incas, Andes, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But yeah. So that was that was my first choice. Um, and I also wanted to be a physical anthropologist uh, within the archaeology because it was like a path within archaeology. Okay, give me a second. I need to let the cat in. Sure. <laughs> What's the cat's name? Yeah. What's the cat's so name? Here we are now. Well, it's Mawa, which translates as the little one, because she's little. Not, I mean, she's old, but uh, she never grew very big. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, That's interesting. Right. I have a, yeah. I have so a I, cat, I have a cat named Maya. <laughs> Maya. Okay. Right. So named it's... after the Mayans. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so and speaking of Mayans. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to do that, but um, for var various reasons, depend uh, well, since I couldn't do that, all I still wanted. So my second choice was to start studying uh, medieval archaeology. I wanted to study the early medieval as well, but it's prohibited according to the rules, so I had to choose something different, and I ended up doing medieval. And um, near Eastern archaeology as my two main courses during the studies. And uh, over time, I started understanding that uh, learning about the late Middle Ages in Europe provides an interesting context for the sword fighting that I that I was 
doing at the time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and somewhere in 2009, I actually approached Bart, who was still my coach then, back then, uh, to ask him how would I possibly contribute to um, like expanding our knowledge about this, given that I'm uh, I'm, I'm pursuing archaeology now. And he proposed that I choose um, a fight book, concentrate on, and start this way. And uh, it so happened that in 2008, if memory serves, there came out a book uh, edited by John Clement, by the way. Um, I can't re recall the title, but it was something like the Renaissance Masters of Defense or something like that. Oh, yeah. And it was an edited vol volume. And there was, uh, there was a translation of uh, uh, manuscript 3227A, or the so-called Dobringer Codex, or Paul, Paul House book, uh, delivered by Grzegorz Żabicki, a professor from Krakow, also an archaeologist and an arms and armor scholar. Ah. Uh, and yeah, I, I got, well, not sure with the text, like I even found how many times I read, read the, the translation and transcription. Uh, but at the time, I, I had, was clueless about term. So I was just following Bert's advice to start trying to figure out which words from the transcription correspond to the English translation. And this was my first exposure to this kind of work with, with medieval texts. Mm. But I got fascinated, and the fascination stayed with me uh, ever since, as I'm still researching the same book after uh, well, sixteen years now. Well, you picked a good one, uh, almost. Yeah. So let me uh, let me. Yeah, a that was that was. Uh... Sure. No, you go go finish what you're saying. Yeah, I mean that was uh, like a winning a lottery in my in my opinion because the book is extremely fascinating. Yeah. And now, now I I look at it like more holistically because during my later research, especially during the doctoral studies, I started to finally go beyond the fight book alone or the defensing content yeah, yeah, within yeah. the book and uh, get a better understanding of what's actually there and the things with which the fencing is surrounded in the text. Right. Okay. So let me let me interject. Yeah, so here. I, yeah. No. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. What do you have? Uh, well, no. I mean, we we can we can do like a detour now or yeah, whatever okay, because so I just... wanted to like fast forward to my doctoral. Uh, yeah. Study, so, so well, I just want to interject briefly because that's this is thirty two twenty seven a was a big was a major influence for me too and I, I want to summarize what it what it is so it, the right the, the third the manuscript thirty two twenty seven a or the poll house book or the you know all the various names this goes by. It is, it, it's a bit perplexing because it's, it's quite different from a lot of the other fight books that we know about. It's not really written for anybody that we can identify. We don't really know who the author or authors or the compiler was. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a house book, which is a really interesting type of, of uh, manuscript from the late medieval period where they would collect useful information that would be good for the household, that would be... It is almost as if, like you know, the database that people would have today in their computer for everything to do with, you know, survival and fixing things and medical uh, thing, you know, uh, first aid and any number of useful th things to know about. And the, the there was a wiki that came out. I guess it was on Wiktenauer maybe first, but uh, where it just had a summary of all the sections of what was in it. And it was so there's the Liber Ignium, which turns out to be a very important mm -hmm. book on pyrotechnics also very mysterious so we don't really know who re really wrote that it's a pseudonym right. and then there's there's bits of alchemy and there's instructions for making toothpaste and how to mix paints and little bits of necromancy and all kinds of things in there uh in addition to s the main fencing text and some other fencing text and so for me uh i was struck by the this was this was one of these things that could not be summarized or fit into the slot of anything that we thought we knew about the Middle Ages at the time that I, as a fencer, I was, you know, uh, getting increasingly interested in, in, in 
I said, you know, this, clearly this thing, a house book, is hard to define what it is and what the the sort the social and uh, cultural context of what is of, of this and and the other elements of the house book itself, like the Liver Ingham, the Pyrotechnics book, lends itself to warfare, for example. And then there's all these other things mm-hmm. that lend itself to lend themselves to civil life. And it's sort of like a window into the complex world around the fight books. And that's where I got into the context stuff that, that I've always been, uh, or since that point, and it, it was probably around 2008 or 2009, I think, when I first ran across that. And, and that really is what started me on trying to understand better, you know, what a, what a burger was in the 15th century. And another thing, this part of the world that's sort of in between the eastern part of the Holy Roman Empire and into Poland and, and into Bohemia, mm-hmm. which is now the Czech lands, uh, is is where you know I remember Mike Ch- Chittister and I were talking about this and we ma- and he made a little map of where the known uh, the, the known origins of all the fencing masters we could find were and they were all, all the, many many of the ones in the German language groups were in this cluster in Central Europe that was sort of in between Poland and Prussia and Silesia and and the Holy Roman Empire and Bohemia so. Mm-hmm. And, and down into Austria and Hungary and, and so on, but this this little line right down the middle, and and that was another big inspiration. So it's sort of like, wow, we got to really dive in and figure out the rest of this because it'll help us understand so much more about how to make sense of the fight books. Because already even then, I mean, in Arma they were doing this. There was already this sort of this habit of almost like Talmudic study of the fight books, where you just analyzing every single word and the in the order of the you know and what is the meaning of this and that and in arma there was a lot of strange ideas that uh were filtering out and i i was participating in their forums in the early 2000s uh so i wasn't in the group but i was sort of exposed i, I ended up becoming very good friends with jake norwood and mike uh cartier and jay vale and some other people that were in arma and they had to be mm-hmm. on the clandestine level since john didn't like me but uh so, so I could see there was problems, like understanding very basic concepts, like sort of like seizing the vor, and, and in the early version of armor, that meant attack and don't parry. That was what a lot of people were saying, you know. And so, so clearly the, there was there was uh, fruitful territory to understand the space around these books, and even in the books, in the case of, of the wonderful one that you picked. Uh, to understand the world that the fight books came out of and what they were, what they were for, and and what you know the big questions like, wh- how real are these? Are these written for middle class people's sports? Or are they written for people that really needed to fight mm-hmm. for their life? Uh, and, and 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 those are still not settled, and those are things that were still are still interesting and still trying to figure out. But I think we understand a lot better. So, the, this and this is other than the the. Uh, MSI 33, which I know has a different designation now, but the this this book is also the earliest in the uh, German language tradition that we know of, right? Is that right? Yeah, so it seems. Right. It's not well. It can be debated, but uh, yeah, the best evidence that we have now, uh, well, tradition somewhere at the the very end of the 14th century, possibly at the very very beginning of the 15th. Yeah, so it's still the the earliest book that we have. Okay, so so keep going. That, I just wanted to throw all that all that uh, all that in there. Yeah, that's that's a that's a nice context to it. Yeah, so I, I got fascinated with the book, and uh, I wasn't allowed to do my bachelor's uh, thesis of on anything related to fencing, uh, which was nice. Uh, actually, I learned a lot. Uh, I was doing medieval pins. Medieval um, one. From one. You were doing pins, medieval. like these sharp objects that you used to fasten the clothing or, oh, okay. I don't know, make your hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to well, yeah, explain yeah, this like better. Yeah, like a stick pin or, uh, or a brooch or, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We had, a, like, I don't know, it was, I think, about 100 of those found in, the, in Poland. It was, like, an old... It was called castle, a Teutonic castle, but uh, because it was in the in the state of the mm, Teutonic or uh, near Meister's uh, town called Pulsk, 
Wait, had, what was uh, the name of the town? It broke up for a second. Had, uh, Utsk. Utsk. P U. Putsk, yeah, P U C K. It's pronounced Putsk uh, in Polish. Yeah, and they had like it was more like a reinforced um, townhouse than a castle, uh, but it was the seat of the local Teutonic Order official who supervised the uh, town and enforced the the rule. So another, I'm going to make order. another little interjection uh, for the Americans, just real quick. Uh, as some of the other, is that the, in this period in the in the 14th century and the, in the 15th, the Teutonic Order had a big monastic sort of warrior uh, crusader state in the northern part of Poland that yeah. overlapped with another one that was in in the the Baltic states on the other side of Lithuania, and Lithuania was sort of in between, and and there was a lot of uh, interplay between the Polish and the Teutonic Knights, who were originally allies and then gradually became rivals. So I'll just interject that, and then that yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty quickly actually. Yeah, and yeah, the, and that's the, true. The Teutonic Knights had, ten, had a tendency to make enemies, including with their own burghers, many of whom ended up joining yes. Poland voluntarily, which is another interesting episode that kind of gets forgotten. And that also that the Teutonic yeah. Knights, even though they were of course Crusader Knights and all that. They were also friars and they were administrators and they spent a lot of time managing things like logging and, and, and production of different uh, types all over their domains. And so that would be a lot of what the, the Brother Knight's jobs would be, would be to be in some remote place like a little castle town or uh, a, a, a manufacturing facility. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, yeah. And put one of those places where you would be dedicated to like surprise things interests of the of the order um uh, yeah so anyway we did the hours and that and later my master's was i that was related to my uh, swordsmanship pursuits and i researched a very peculiar weapon held at the royal treasury um, of the vavel castle vavel is in krakow and it used to be the royal residence of the kings of Poland until the capital was moved to Warsaw in the 16th, well, almost in the 17th century. And also the layer um, is above the layer of the dragon too, right? Yeah, that's right. There's there's been a drag. There has been a dragon. There had been a dragon there, uh, allegedly. Um, and there's a, there's a nice fire briefing statue still yeah, next to the yeah. castle. Uh, so it's kids' favorite. Uh, when tourists come to, bet, yeah. <laughs> to, to visit the city, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, they they have a sword that looks, in many respects, very similar to those um, Kampfschwerter or these swords meant for judicial combat that can be found in one of Tachelfer's fight books, with spiked uh, quillens, with a mace-like pommel, and very yeah, very yeah. robust. With uh, yeah, so it's I so like I did a, that. A super S -dot that was. For for armored uh, fencing. And yeah, exactly. Reaction. It's like, a, yeah. I think I remember your article. And a stock on this. steroids. Yeah, I think I read your yes, article. Yes, I, I like managed a, to publish. In the, in the, did you publish in the APD or something at some point about that? Yes, that was my first contribution to, to the journal. Yeah. I have a couple of And that was based on my, on my master's thesis. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I read I, them. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think, but I think, I think your, that one might have been in one of the ones that I had an article in because I think I have it. I think I have that one on my shelf. Uh, it was 2013, a year after my master's in French. And after I, I stopped doing the academic stuff around horsemanship because of reasons I started, uh, well, I started to live, well, I moved out of my parents and started living on my own. I need to get a job, then I got a family, and this stuff happens. And, uh, in 2018, for various reasons, mostly motivated by the, the very nice scholarship that they proposed, I applied to a, a doctoral program at the university. And it was uh, a nice program because it was designed to be interdisciplinary, and they specifically wanted to focus on the theme of the connection between nature and culture and uh, I decided that the concept of actually investigating the past with your own body the way we do in HEMA in general 
was in line with this topic. So I drafted a PhD proposal in 2018 uh, that was focused on, um, well, on theory building, especially on the question whether embodied research as understood in anthropology and used to investigate present societies can be adapted to investigate the past societies. My goal was to like build a theory around this, uh, check whether and to what extent this is a viable thing to do academically. And then I wanted to test this on manuscript 327A uh, as my test case. So that was that was the PhD proposal. And I sent it, not hoping very much that, you know, gonna let it pass, but some of they did. So, so I that, see the that program. Al that alone is a, is a major thing because um, this has been an issue in the, in the study of, of historical fencing since since the early days. You know, we, a, a big part of the birth of the whole thing, and this is not for you, I know you know all this, this is for the, some other people who may be listening, uh, was when uh, Dr. Sidney Anglo wrote this book, uh, The Martial Arts of Renaissance Europe, back in uh, the late 90s. Mm -hmm. and, um, but since then, figuring out where to slot in research about historical fencing has been really tricky. And it ties to, I think, to, maybe you can comment on this, but I think it ties to the fact that academia missed the martial arts. So, when, you know, when I was coming up, when I was a kid looking for somehow to sword fight, because I think it's in our, I think it's in every, every child in the world, it, it, to some extent, has this gene of wanting to sword fight that goes back, you know, some sort of right. thing that, that we have inherited. And I was looking for that, and there was no evidence anywhere. I mean, I, I bought a lot of books. I went, I, went, I was cruising around, you know, used bookstores for looking for anything, and libraries, and I couldn't find anything about, you know, how did knights fight, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And, and um, so we, my friends and I used to just put on uh, motorcycle helmets and, you know, with sticks and fight for fun, which was great, but uh, it was not available to us. And somehow academia, in spite of the, the huge cultural interest and in all these, you know, we've got all these movies and every, even the science fiction movies are about sword fighting and the Star Wars, you know, but somehow we couldn't find out that there was it, you know, and all the interest in the Japanese fencing, you know, and, and in Chinese fencing, and mm -hmm. everything. we couldn't figure out there was fencing in Europe. And somehow, even though these books were all over the place and they were sitting around in university archives and libraries and, and in uh, private collections, and somehow academia just missed it. And they, they, because it's not really warfare necessarily, or we're still not really sure to what extent it is. And it's not purely civilian because a lot of the people that in the split in academia, at least in the US, I know. You know the people that are into warfare that's one group and a lot of them are sort of military affiliated and such whereas the ones that are not don't want anything to do with anything to any kind of fighting so there's this gap that was left and there was a there was a structural gap that had to do with the nature of academic how academic research is organized and one of the so on the i know on the history side we've had some proposals of historical fencing has been part of gender studies which i find a little bit baffling i think it's apparently my understanding, and I, I had a peer reviewer, I'm not gonna name, very nice person, but um, that the idea was, that who expressed the idea that this this is, this fencing, this, this sort of the fencing with the implication of a lot of dueling and informal dueling, I guess, and brawling with swords is a form of pathology associated with men. And there's some problems with that because women fence too, we, as we know, as, at least to some extent. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, to me, the taxonomy is weird, and I know that Daniel Chaquet has tried to work some angles to, to sort of broaden that a little bit. Uh, and it, so it's a delicate process, I just wanna say that. It's hard to figure out how to sl slot this in. And so to me, it seems that the idea of getting an archeology span uh, uh, thesis accepted as a, as a proposal that would take this particular angle and then assuming that, that they trusted you enough that you're gonna do this with appropriate rigor and in, in a serious way, which you did, in my opinion, um, that's, you know, bravo on that, because that, that's, uh, that seems like Thanks. an accomplishment, just to figure out how to fit this in so that academic can see it, and it can recognize that we don't lose it again, because we might lose it, you know, we, as you know, there was a, there was a rediscovery of these fencing manuals in the late 19th century, you know, guys like Hutton, and you know, right. Sir Richard Burton, and then it disappeared. It was some very smart, very, very hip people that knew a lot, but it didn't spread beyond them, and it could have. This could happen to us too, you know. It might be gone. Sure. In 30 yeah, years. very true. 
So continue. Sure, okay. Yeah, but let me first let out because she now wants to be on the other side of the <laughs> of door. Of course she does. Just yeah. a second. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's the reach goal whenever i need to do any remote meeting or conference or whatever yeah. that she just comes in the middle stays for a while and then just starts scratching the door to yeah, let her not, out you're not paying enough attention uh, it's endlessly yeah i have i have one right. that does almost the same yeah. thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think it's the cat cat thing uh, yeah anyways uh yeah I, I considered this well, maybe not. Maybe well, yeah. I, I think I consider it an achievement to actually fit that into the the scheme of the academic things. And as as I mentioned, it, the program was interdisciplinary, meaning that it wasn't a purely archaeological project, and it couldn't be. Yeah. Because most archaeologists are still like vividly opposed to uh, my approach, and especially the fact that I call it a kind of archaeology, because I, I think about it as archaeology of motion. And well, this would require probably a longer explanation. That's uh, no, go, go, perhaps go beside that little, the point go, here, but go into that a little bit, though, because that's such a key part of your of your thesis that I found it really interesting. Just okay, start, fine. But, but first, I, I wanted to I wanted to make clear that it was um, it was archaeology and Cultural studies, which are two different disciplines. Um, cultural studies in Poland a group uh, disciplines like ethnography, anthropology, uh, religious studies, this kind of stuff, which is focused on the present societies mostly. But in researching them, always have some, well, maybe not always, but usually have has some well, historical outlook by necessity. Right, so anthropology generally tends to globally as a discipline sprawls. It has been sprawling for a while. And the clear focus on present communities to questions also stretching back to the past as as now projecting also um, projecting some kind of you know potential futures, like in the the anthropological you know, reflection on post-humanism or the future future um well isms or whatever kind of you know configurations that humans will develop with non-human things that they create and yeah so leaving that aside um my project was seen as something in between archaeology and these this outlook offered this present outlook offered by anthropology specifically because it actually uh, it, it actually makes sense because, uh, in my approach, the present practice is used as uh, to, is used to produce data points, so to say, that are then used to reflect on the past. Uh, and uh, I call it archaeology after like long debates with my supervisors on that on that particular point. I still call it archaeology because I see motion. The motion of the human body, what I usually call the bodily motion, I see it as a material artifact uh, on par with things like pottery or weapons or clothing that we can, you know, dig during excavations. Because, first of all, motion, although it is very ephemeral because it can be perceived uh, only as long as it lasts and then it like disappears. But nevertheless, it is still a material thing. You sense the motion through your body, and it is produced through the body. Uh, and even more so, motions behave a lot like other material artifacts, because motions can be, for instance, traded or trans or or given. For instance, when you teach somebody, they can be stolen if you you know and see and appropriate emotion that was not meant for you. They can be exchanged, they um, can be hidden, and can be they can be hoarded. Uh, uh, which is a little bit like right? what a fight book and, does, right? Right, yeah. They can be uh, also, that's my, uh, that's my thesis actually, they can be constructed just like a potter 
um, just like pottery can be glued together. You can find a shirt uh, and then based on it, for instance, the, the part of the diameter of a vessel's mouth that you get, you can like infer the, the actual you know, size of the vessel and from there you can proceed to reconstruct the whole thing. Uh, even though you have just a bunch of you know pieces from it, yeah, right. So uh, so that that's why I, I see it as the kind of archaeology. But this is very unorthodox, and many archaeologists actually disagree with me, and they don't want you know to see that kind of studies as part of archaeology. Okay, so let, yeah, let they me contextualize see... this a bit to, to, again. So I think because I remember this to John Clement's credit, this is something that he used to talk about. I remember he used to mention that you know. Whereas today we're sitting in these chairs that have padded seats and and uh, you know we drive around in cars and we have we have we have a, there's a certain kind of motion a certain kind of walking sit sitting was not something necessarily that everybody did as much arguably in in, in uh, mm -hmm. you know, 500 years ago they're certainly not sitting on polyurethane foam that you can that you can uh, you know, right right get fat on uh, you know but they were walking around in cobblestones and they're and they're um, you know their their posture. We can we can see from uh, various evidence, not just from illustrations of books and, and just written descriptions, but also from art and, and uh, you know arguably you know, clothing and other things. And and that, that there are specific types of motion, human motion, that would be associated, for example, with crafts or with professions like medicine or in uh, maritime world and you know operating ships. And then the the the, right. martial, the martial arts, the grappling and the fencing and all that, also has specific motions that come out of the world that these people are in, that that the, the lifestyle they live and the way they walk and they they move around, and then translate it into, uh, as you say, hoarded motions that that can um, even though you're using a literary source in large part, not solely because you can also look at, for example armor and clothing and things like that that have survived mm -hmm. and infer a lot from that like you could from a little piece of a beaker but uh so yeah so that so there's this idea that that there's there's this world of of emotions that have been encoded in literature that we can um enter and see uh so much more about this world which is analogous to the way i see the fight books in general that i, I always have a running joke that I think there, there are time portals that you can go in, but you, you've taken it to another level, mm -hmm. which I think is fascinating. And one other comment I just wanted to make, uh, when you were talking about this idea of anthropologists extrapolating into the future, uh, it really brought to mind, uh, I'm sure you've read uh, St the Polish science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem. Did you ever read him? Yeah, but just briefly, and that's the thing that I'm actually ashamed of, but yeah, uh, that's true. Just yeah, briefly in high the, school. He's so. one of the few that are known outside of uh, the, your part of the world, but uh, I'm a big fan. I actually read him when I was a kid, and um, he has this one book called The Future Logical Congress, which is sort of a satire of um, mm -hmm. world politics and, and them trying to figure out what to do about all these uh, imminent problems that are coming. And a big part of the running joke of that book was he was taking vocabulary and extrapolating it, what it was mm -hmm. going to lead to. And he, he actually predicted a whole bunch of really interesting things, including the name of the drug ecstasy and uh, like a, a lot. Oh, did he? I didn't it, know that. <laughs> it was a fascinating intellectual exercise where he was just really, he was extrapolating from the language of the day to what it was evolving into. And, and he predicted a lot of things that have actually come true since he wrote that in the 80s. And uh, you know that it was very much an anthropological. In fact, I think I think some of the characters were supposed to be anthropologists that were going to the conference, and it was just it was a way to send up and make ridicule um, various approaches to solving the world's problems, which didn't, from his point of view, look like they were going to succeed. And uh, uh, anyway, that's a that's a uh, that's right. A, 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 yeah. So so if 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 you're if you're into land, uh, and and uh, well and futuro fut to futurology. And yeah, I I wrote. I wasn't sure which way it's gonna show, and so I wrote in both ways. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, oh well, maybe it didn't work that well. There, there's a there's a lady that I actually well knew very briefly, but uh, her name is Bogna Konyor. She's doing like fascinating stuff based on Lem's ideas, as well as uh, writings of. Um, female, uh, well, uh, uh, writings of medieval nuns, 
like like female monastic oh, yeah. practitioners. Wow, uh, that's an interesting and it's, combination. It's, it's yeah, and it's it actually makes a lot of sense. So you may check check her out. She she has some stuff online on YouTube, including some oh wow yeah, well, including at that. least one one. E, um, how do you call it? I forgot. When you give a like a prominent speech at a conference, it's called a a lecture keynote. Yeah, no, a, a keynote. keynote. It's called oh, a keynote. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that sounds yeah, anyway, really interesting. Uh, That's another subject that I'm, I'm like a Hildegard von Bingen. I have a uh, I've made a kind of an alliance with Karin Versled about this. Uh, that I, I think she should be as famous as as uh, Copernicus in a way because she's sort of a she's sort of the original. Yes, of, I agree. Yeah, and and she's sort of the originator of the Kreuterbuch which is another really mm -hmm. interesting genre of medieval literature that overlaps with the house book. It's sort of like a medical slash, right. uh, anyway. So yeah, that's another, that's a wonderfully interesting angle, but let's get back to your, your motion, your theory of motion. So you, you're seeing evidence in the literature of the time and I, I assume other, other sources. I know that you did some of your fencing in period shoes and so on, but you're seeing some evidence of the, of the period of time. It's like a, a, an imprint, almost like a fingerprint of the motions that they were using. Yes. So, I mean, the, the, the basic idea, and I I found this empirically later while testing the theory, but the, the basic premise was that um, artifacts that uh, people produce are not only produced through bodily motion, when a craftsman creates those through the motion of their own body and the tools, but they are also created with some motion in design I mean, with some motion designed to them, uh, and to to some, and, and this means that you know each artifact is also created with the human body in mind, because there has to be like attunement between the possibilities offered by the tool and the capacities of the body that is you know meant to use the tool. Right, and uh, the, these these capacities and possibilities are often now in uh, well, they are, they are often now called affordances. Borrowing from the theory of affordances developed in so psychological ecology and started by James. By there James, is no need thing here to delve. James, James Gibson, Gibson, G I B S O N, Gibson. Uh, yeah, so there's it, it, it's like a very large community of scholars and a prominent field in itself. And the theory of affordances uh, helps me, as well as, for instance, Bart Valjak, conceptualize our work with fight books in much more concrete terms. Because, um, well, yeah, I think I need to summarize it briefly. Because affordance, as per Gibson, is uh, is a relational property well well no it's a property that dwells a relation between a, a, an agent Gibson calls the animals because he's talking not only about humans but any actually animate being so let's call it agent right or actor so uh, affordance dwells in the relation between the actor and the environment to simplify it a little okay so uh for instance, if we have, uh, let's say, a stone, uh, what the stone affords, the possibilities it creates, are not like inherent to the stone itself, but they are like a function of the relation between the stone and a particular agent or actor that want to interact with it. So, for instance, for a monkey, the stone can be used as the projectile as uh, something to strike something else with but for a bird it can be something to swallow to help it digest its food uh, for a bug it will be a shelter this kind of like i'm simplifying a lot but just yeah, to convey okay. the basic idea of the relational relationality of affordances right so they are never absolute they are not objective but they are also not objective because the stone is all these things it's a shelter it's a kind of food it's a projectile all at once it cannot fulfill all these um 
roles for everyone and not at all uh, at the same time uh, and what the concept of the affordances thus sort of forces on you when you start to think in the these terms is uh, that um, the pieces of environment like the stone or the the grass or whatever is there around an agent and um, they, they work in close conjunction with the agents and some pieces of environment are just found the affordances are there just by chance so to say but others are uh, sort of worked or designed to have certain affordances for certain actors right, so right? Like and this is it's like when a, a monkey takes the leaves off of a stick and uses it to stick it in a termite mound he's... yeah exactly now the stick has been designed for a specific purpose right so it, it lost certain affordances that could be used by others for instance someone who would like to eat the leaves right it's no longer it does no no longer afford um, you know, eating the leaves, right? But it has other affordances specifically for the monkey, but not for another animal, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is what we're talking about. And um, in my thinking about the archaeology of motion, this concept is especially important uh, Well, because affordances create a sort of landscape in which practices happen. So to illustrate this for a HEMA audience, there's much talk about uh, how modern footwear, for instance, or the protective gear changes fencing, even the mindset about fencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big right. Issue. So these things, the the clothing that we wear, the 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 ground, the flooring, on on which we move during fighting, uh -huh. the weapons that we use, are all. Uh, parts of the environment in which the practice that we do unfolds so and they provide different affordances like for instance um, rubber sole shoes offer very different traction than leather sole shoes so yeah. their affordances are different this has been the same goes for weapons big, clothing big issue especially i would say in between the the people that call themselves wma or western martial arts versus the hema and it would meaning like the more kind of modernized tournament world this is this issue of the footwear has been a major debate for 25 years and the other issue that i think is getting um lingering uh, and maybe coming up more now is the idea of, of how much all the protective gear that we wear uh shapes the way we uh practice fencing and the way we think about it and the way we uh, uh interpret it and understand it which is an issue that i'm i'm a little bit invested in because you know here where i live we, we're in we're in the swamp or in the jungle you know seven months out of the year it's very hot so uh for 20 years when i was fencing i didn't i didn't wear all that gear i never wore a fencing jacket the only time i ever wore a jacket a fencing jacket was in a tournament if they made me do it and um mm -hmm. and you know i we, we would wear minimal and i think actually i felt safer with less gear when i have all the extra gear on i feel like i can't really move um and people of course attune attenuate their fencing to that and and i you know i don't know if you know this guy uh uh, Peter Turia in in Moravia, um, but he's got a group that's sort of a parallel. It's it's not precisely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know so, him. So I, they, I I have never met him, but yeah, I, I haven't met him in person, but we've talked a lot online. Uh, and very nice fellow, um, at least in my interactions with him. But what's relevant is just that his group they do they've reconstructed fencing in a very different way, where they don't they don't use safety gear, so they they're trying to copy a little bit more like what they what was done in the day which we know that they they did have some face some safety gear we've seen images of gloves and but they they could have worn mm -hmm. fencing masks and they didn't and so we have to ask ourselves why that was and, and then how that shaped what they were doing the affordances and so on uh, as you were saying so that it, it is right. i just wanted to bring this up that it, it is a it's a big debate in the hema world because some of us i think some people are, are seeing that the the competition sport is becoming more attuned to itself like following the 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 path of of every every adjustment we made for safety seems to lead to more adjustments for more safety which is combining with tournament rules that are 
also, uh, you know, sort of push going in a certain direction uh, where the fencing is becoming a little uh, more uh, tailored to the sport. And, and this has also been a perennial debate, but it, it's a question of like, yeah, we all op open up, open up other ways of, of testing this out and doing it. So I just want to throw that out. There. Again, the debate is actually complicated and, uh, well, yeah, I think yeah, maybe maybe it's not important right now what I think on these matters. But what I wanted to to like clarify at the end of this uh, talk about uh, the the affordances and the landscape of affordances is that important thing that actually differs in my approach from what you would call experimental archaeology is that in experimental archaeology you you need to follow um, the scientific method. So you need to have these like rigorous experimental protocols, which means that the vast, vast majority of ex archaeological experimental studies are short term. And very and highly, very even highly if they focused. Yes, uh, I mean, they, they last like a few from from a few hours to let's say a few weeks at best, which means that there is uh, a problem of an unsurmountable problem of skill. Because the results produced in experiment when you use skilled subjects may differ very much from the result that you will get while using rookies. And uh, my approach, on the other hand, is focused on prolonged exposure to the affordance landscape so my my point is that the, the landscape of affordances creates a, a number of constraints that will guide your exploration in certain directions and uh, the whole point of archaeology of motion is to create or recreate an affordance landscape that is as tightly um compatible with what we know from other sources to be the past reality to guide your practice in the direction of the past practice right so it's not about actually reconstructing anything in the sense that we like start to move like say Fiore de Lilberi or Joachim Meyer because that's impossible you can't move like a past person did you can't even move like you did a week before. Yeah, because I, I, in can't, I can't, terms, move, like, the I can't way... move like I did back in the uh, when I was fighting tournaments because my knees are blown out, unfortunately. It... Yeah, <laughs> one thing, but you know, if you tie tie your shoes uh, today, it's the motion is in absolute terms it's different from your yesterday's sure, tying. Of course, yeah. Although we recognize it as the same motion, right? So. Um, the in my approach it's about setting your practice in motion in this affordance landscape that's historically informed and then check what is the trend of the changes in your practice over a, a longer period of time and sort of projecting that into the past so I, yeah I, that's I, how I, I, how I think... I think I have an analogy for that because, uh, you know, one of the example of that is like this debate about trying to understand what armor really was. That was another, that's another thing that's the big. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I would go to these Renaissance festivals. The American Renaissance Festival is, was like one of the most ridiculous things you've ever seen in your life. And um, I noticed a lot of my European friends love them because they're just so American and, you know, but they have nothing to do with the Middle Ages. And what you would used to see when I was a kid was you'd go there and there's some guys putting together armor and he says, okay, well, what could you do in armor? Well, you see armor is so heavy that you could, you know, if you fell over, you're gonna, you couldn't get up without a crane. And, and, and as you can see, it really didn't help very much. It, it only protects against glancing blows and, and it's, you're very clumsy and they're walking around. This is in the eighties, right? And compare that to what Daniel Jacquet did when he got a proper suit of armor that actually was tailored to him. And then having spent some time understanding how it was used that's crucial right mm -hmm. that's with the tie-in and and then wearing it in the airplane on the way to the u.s which is another <laughs> but he, sorry. He, he put some time in he put some time in what does it mean to wear armor for that long you know he, did, he ran a marathon he did ox, uh, obstacle courses alongside 
firemen and, and so mm -hmm. on. So we know that's a good example because we can see much different results. Suddenly it's like, oh, you can do cartwheels in armor. You can do, you can run a, a, a I don't know how long of a, a race he ran, but he did a 10K race or whatever he did. And uh, we suddenly start to see that you can actually do a lot more if you, at, if you are even a little bit emulating the way the, the, uh, the evidence tells us that people used it in the, t in the period. So this is what you're. Yeah, talking that's about. exactly true. So this is what you're doing with the fencing. You're you're saying I'm not. It's. I remember just recently they had a pretty interesting study where they put some armor, uh, some some very early like Mycenaean armor, and they gave it to some Greek soldiers, mm -hmm. and they had a. You probably saw that too, right? So, that was interesting. But I my first thought was if those guys spent a little time actually, you know, working with javelins and and spears and 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 sort of hoplite training you know some, some sort of early olympic type training that their results would have been very different you know then yeah, probably but they, they also accounted for this in the study actually and in a smart way so it, yeah i i read this paper and it's it's really good actually um so i, I mean the, their discussion of their results is very well thought out uh yeah but th this is this is the crux uh, the the time that you allow for the uh, affordances to speak to your body, mm. and this is where the actual research on the past can happen. Mm. That's my view, and especially this this is one thing that I found um, that I verified through the, the the empirical study. For instance, you know, one thing that struck me is that, um, well, you know, while I was applying this theory and working with uh, the manuscript 32278a uh, i used uh, many like methods that are used in anthropology in similar studies for the present um present day researchers and one one thing was field journaling which meant that i kept a journal every single day throughout 12 months and um and i noted many things there uh, according to a cer certain questioner, and there was always room to, uh, well, reflect on footwear, uh, footwear uh, that I use. And one thing that I found was that while um, at the beginning, switching to historical footwear, leather sold shoes, was very limiting and changed the way I was able to move and therefore fight this um, this difference would diminish over time until i was actually uh, able to do whatever i did in the modern shoes still with the with the historical shoes on the grass on the on dry grass on wet grass on sand on snow you 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 name it uh, the difference never disappeared completely but it was much 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 smaller than what i found out at the beginning and this is something that um, comes to my mind whenever i read uh, people quoting their own experience with historical shoes and arguing that it changes fencing so much yeah and, that's and this been is a, that's been a big now, issue for a long time <laughs> Yeah, so to me, it is an indicator that these these persons did not spend much time actually uh, in historical footwear trying to do to do fencing, or perhaps after the initial experiences, they modified their fencing to fit mm -hmm. their shoes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of you know, trying to realize the same goals while wearing historical footwear. Right, so they were self-limiting themselves. In, and this is an of, important thing. Instead of thing exploring that's... the affordances of the object that they were that yes, they were given, exactly. They they, they, exactly. Tried, they just tried to make structural changes before they had even really gotten used to it, and and that. Uh, that's right. Was... That's right. And I see it a lot in this uh, in the folks um, on this, like you know, minimal gear side of the debate. That what I what I see there is that they seem to often limit themselves like they are overly cautious so to say yeah yeah i've seen so that. they like abandon the project of becoming good fencers for fear 
that they would do things in an in has, in unhistorical way because of the initial experiences with the limitations imposed by historical gear or the lack of um, the lack of protective gear. Yeah. Whereas from my study, I am now pretty convinced that the opposite approach is much more informative about the path. And by the opposite approach, I mean looking first on what kind of objectives uh, fight books uh, tell us, what they want us to achieve, and try, then try to achieve these things despite the limitations that come from uh, historical equipment, for instance. Yeah, adapt yourself as well as you can. Right? I, I, yeah, I, yeah. So, for instance, you know, yeah, one thing that I wanted to, to say is, for instance, uh, lunging. In the manuscript three to the seven a in its fight book, we have a, a move called full threaten, which is arguably describes something akin to a lunge because generally it's well, it consists in extending your front foot as far as you can during an offensive action, um, and uh, well, when I first uh, started wearing historical shoes. I lost this ability because I would end up on the ground. Uh -huh. But at the end of my study, I like completely regained my lunge with very subtle technical tweaks to it, to accommodate for the the different traction and the different uh, ground. But uh, yeah, but it was it was back there. And um, you, you, but it it took a few months. You actually entered a. a... One of the large tournaments in Poland and, and fought using only techniques from 3 to 7A and using historical shoes, is that right? Well, not only because I broke uh, a little under pressure, uh, but yeah, I did my it. best to use. Yeah. What is the chief difference yeah, that's... between 32-27A techniques versus your, let's say, a uh, uh, earlier repertoire of, of, uh, of HEMA um, uh, longsword fencing that you had learned or master fencing? Well, there's a lot. Actually, it's a very different fencing from from what is usually well conceived as uh, Lichtenauerian fencing, so to well, say. Yeah, nowadays, a, that brings up another question: Do, do we cons do you consider thirty two twenty seven A to be distinct from the Lichtenauer tradition, or related to it, or uh, part of it, or what? Well, it, it certainly sits well in the middle of the tradition in many respects. Because the, the author was clearly very fond of Lichtenauer's concepts. And he like repeats many times that he sees Lichtenauerian fencing as the real deal. Meaning that it is the kind of fencing that you would actually um, use when you want to kill or avoid being killed. Uh, and he two opposes distinct, or she, perhaps. Two distinct goals that are equally important, I, I like to point right. out. Yeah, that's that's also true. Yeah, but what he points out is that the, the Lichtenauerian fencing is something that actually works when you want to uh, want to harm the other person. Or not whereas, be harmed. Uh, yeah. yeah, whereas other forms of fencing, of which he's also aware, other traditions, so to say, um, to him appear too conventionalized to be applicable against a really hostile opponent. Right, so this is this is where he sees Lichtenauerian fencing and its merit, but he's clearly aware of other traditions. So yeah, that that's a. Let me ask you another kind of. He's not not he's he's not in the tradition in the sense that um, he is like a complete Lichtenauer fanboy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's clearly aware of other traditions, and he is also he also acknowledges certain strengths of non Lichtenauerian fencing. Uh, right. But then again, I see it still as part of the Lichtenauerian tradition because it's very heavily influenced and it also quotes the Zettel, the largest portion of the Zettel that we know of. Uh, right. Yeah, and perhaps so perhaps then the differences are because it's earlier than the rest. That's my and working it's also, hypothesis. And it's, also an, it's, like a, it's more of an inter internal... It's like maybe something he wrote for himself and or maybe like his nephew or other members of his household or somebody else in his guild or something. It's not written for a, a duke like some of these other ones are. 
well, yeah, certainly it's not written or it has no dedication. Yeah. So that, that that's for sure. And the style the, is the, different the in that sense, right? Yeah, the style is also distinct. Uh, for instance, the the author seems to like. Um, he 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 seemed to have never fully decided whether he's speaking or writing. Because the patterns that he uses switch back and forth between oral, and uh, and written. Written communication. That's one thing. Uh, right. Also, the physical object that the that the manuscript is certainly not an elegant uh, or prestigious object because it's a tiny book it's like pocket size oh, I didn't and that. Uh, uh, yeah written on very cheap um, cheap paper and parchment uh, usually off cuts or you know like reused stuff and it oh, was yeah. actually a bunch of se separate notebooks that have been put together still by the same person uh, back in the day uh, to be made into a single little codex. Uh, so yeah, it it certainly was not intended as uh, as a gift or an elegant copy. Perhaps it was a draft for one. Mm, yeah. Uh, there are some reasons to believe that this might have been the case. Right, but that what we have, what survived, is certainly not the not the prestigious object. Yeah. Sometimes things evolve that way. I mean, that was how like my little. Uh... My Baltic book, uh, my history book, uh, started out mm -hmm. as my own notes. It was for me to make sense of trying. I was just trying to figure out what. I started with Peter von Danzig. I was looking for. I was gonna. I was looking for the the fight book, and I found the ship instead. And then went in a rabbit hole, and came out. You know, seven years later, and then, so eventually I made it. <laughs> I made it to where I could, and that was that was just still the middle of the of the project, really. But it evolved during that time to something. Okay, well, I want to show this to a couple of my friends, and then I, that means I got to clean it up a little bit. I have to, you know, try to. And so gradually, it turned into right. this thing that was never really intended for public. Uh, I, you know, I was I was too embarrassed to show it to most people for a really long time, and then now I now I just throw them out all over the place. <laughs> but uh, so right. I have one comment and a and a question that are both very kind of newbie, uh, but partly for the audience because some of these people what are listening to this if there still are. Uh, may not be fencers, so I just want to comment that the settle is the, uh, the the mnemonic poem that's in all the Lichtenauer uh, corpus fight books. So it's 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 this uh, it's something that would be probably from the oral tradition where it, you're reciting uh, a, a poem that to remember all the elements of, of of how the fencing works and it's all the the sh sort of shorthand of the devices and the main principles. And then the various fight uh, fencing masters that we know of wrote the glosses, which are the explaining in sort of plain English, and in often in surprisingly contemporary sounding English. I, know I, I like to point out that a lot of it doesn't sound, it doesn't read like if you're an American and you're look, studying the medieval anything, you're reading things like Ch Ch Chaucer, uh, which has a certain, you know, or even back to Beowulf or something, where, where it has a certain very archaic style of speech and everything whereas when I'm reading um, 15th century stuff from Germany Poland Italy Bohemia it really sounds like you and I was talking or people that I would speak to normally except that um, you know they, they've got a, some different education often much better educated <laughs> than most people I know today you know that the people that are, if, especially if it's a university trained person they're going to know that you know the seven liberal arts they're trained in rhetoric uh, you know, but it's easy read. And um, the other part of what you mentioned, you were talking about 3227A, not exactly a disciple of Lichtenauer, is aware of Lichtenauer, borrows from Lichtenauer, but he's a little bit looking at it from the point of view of somebody that's also knowledgeable on the subject and knows other sources. These other sources, there's always this, I'm embarrassed to even ask this question, but I'm gonna, going to because it comes up a lot in our world which is the idea of the, the common fencing, uh, that you know, there, there's this theory that's been around for a while that, that Lichtenauer tradition fencing, which is, uh, includes a lot of uh, devices that are, that are kind of tricky, and it has an emphasis on, on a attack for, you know, attacking to make yourself safe, uh, you know, attack, attacking to defend and combining attack with defense, uh, that it's maybe layered over a, a more widely known fencing system that is, uh, implicit 
and there's been a lot of interesting experiments along those lines. And I've also seen some really good debunking of that, That because we know that we have that in some of the Iberian manuals where they, did, they distinguish between the, the, the distressa commune and the distressa especial. There's, there's the common fencing and then there's mm -hmm. the fancy fencing over it. So the, the I, I know this is none of this is new to you, but for other people listening, that the idea is that they relate to an hour fencing, which is in some ways a little bit peculiar. Um, it does seem like expert level, let's say, is it is it is it that and and are these other systems maybe this more common fencing or do you see it as just other systems that would have been we just lost they're kind of lost to history and we would know better or maybe they maybe they relate to some of the other uh, wings of the uh, the sort of German language uh, or other uh, regional uh, fencing masters and fencing cl cluster right of, of fight okay yeah so as as far as common fencing goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's I know there's a relatively fresh paper by Andrzej Vodička specifically on that. And I would be well, much more ready to give you a, an informed answer if I had read the paper, yeah, I need to which read I that didn't. <laughs> so, sorry, Andrzej. I, I have a lot of respect. Uh, for Andrzej. Yeah, so it's still really on my on my two. Yeah, yeah, he's the, he's the, he's the guy. So probably there's a lot of good stuff in there but i'm not uh well in a position now to to talk about this uh, as far as i can tell from reading the manuscript 3227a alone is that um there certainly was non lichtenauerian fencing but i from this manuscript there is nothing that would suggest that this non lichtenauerian stuff formed a coherent body of knowledge mm, mm -hmm. uh, at least from the the manuscript author's perspective so it n nowhere in the text he would like contrast one system to another right what he was focused was rather uh contrasting uh serious fencing what he calls at one place he calls it ernst yeah with Schimpf or Schulfechten, right. meaning either playful fencing or school fencing, right? So this is his main, um, well, well, dichotomy that he works with, or she, and, like and, the author. And, and this is a very, uh, important, they, they work with. very important distinction that is another source of, of uh, consternation in, in, the, in the HEMA world, especially among people that are not that well read on the manuals, to be honest, uh, which is the idea that they, they get stuck on how much of how much of this is for play and how much of it is for serious and and many fight books make this dis same distinction between the shul faction or the shim faction which is the play fighting or the training fighting or sometimes maybe the display fighting versus when you when you've got to do it for real and the, right. the reasons are, are to me very obvious because what i want to do i wanted to play sword fight i had been in sort of brawls back in the old days in the old punk rock days here right and the problem with the brawls is you can end up in the hospital or, or jail, and both of those are unpleasant. Whereas when I did HEMA, I got dings, you know, I got a few bruises, a little bit here and there, maybe broke some thumbs or uh, fingers. Uh, not bad enough to go to the hospital, I just kept, went right through it. It was plenty of fun, I learned how to fight a lot better, and, and I was definitely, we're definitely doing play fighting, and I think that's how you learn. Lion, lion cubs play to learn how to be a killer. You know, the Mongols had all sorts of yeah. they did wrestling games and ho wrestling on horses and shooting the popinjay just like they did in Europe to learn how to be. Well, nobody's going to accuse the Mongols of being, uh, you know, not good at their job of, of poor, uh, poor fighters. Uh, yeah, true. Fighting. So I think a play, playing to fight is this is another thing I think is really interesting because there's a huge dichotomy between play to learn, playing to learn anything serious versus the. I don't know, maybe like the sort of Roman way that we learned, uh, in, you know, when I was in the army, when I went to boot camp, and they, they assume that you don't know how to brush your teeth, you don't know how to make a bed, you don't know how to walk, you do everything the army way, they, 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 and, they, and, and there's, there's very little fun involved. Eventually, later, when you get a little training, you do some games, eventually they get to that point, but it's this, we scream at you, you do what you're told, you shut up, and, you know, whereas... The, the, the way that they learned how to not just fencing but uh, but warfare and all kinds of skills related to warfare was done with a, a huge range of games and also things like hunting uh, activities and so on but mm -hmm. um, 
there's all these games all to this day all over Europe. When I, I was a kid, I, I spent time in France. My, my, my family's from France, where my family's, my mother was from. And then I was in the army in, in Germany, where I, and, I, and around other places in Italy and places, I, you know, you see these games going on. Every, every, there's festivals every certain, certain times of the year, and they people come out, you know, they're on stilts and they're beating each other in the head with a, you know, I don't know, like a, you know, a, a dummy rabbit or something. But it, they're, but they're serious ones where they're shooting and, and they're, uh, you know, like in France they have this thing where they, they joust on on ships, on, on boats. They knock each other off boats with... Uh, yeah, I, I I read about it. And yeah. The, and the horse race. Yeah, so there's, we have traces. Of... Yeah, and, I, and you know, I read in uh, Philippe Dollinger, uh, the, who's the, the Hans expert, unfortunately, all the, the, the records from a lot of the Hans cities are, are uh, were unavailable or they were sort of misused for a long time but the, the best book you can get in English on the Hanseatic League is this guy Philippe Dollinger from Strasbourg from the, who wrote this book in the 1970 and he has an anecdote in there from Poland on the uh, I'm going to mispronounce this and I'm not going to say it right in the Polish way the Wisla Wisla River Vistula in English Wisła oh, yeah Vistula but Wisła uh, in Polish so on, on the Wisła River in the beginning when they were having the uh, the the uh, Harvest. They would have. They would go down in barges. They're going all the way down to the Prussian cities to get them to the coast. You know, so they can go out and sell it. And the first b barges full of grain that gets to Dansk is going to get the best prices. So they're they're having little like war on the way down. They're knocking each other mm -hmm. off the rafts with the poles. And there's sort of rules. Right. But then simultaneously, he also mentions that during the Thirteen Years' War between the the Prussian cities had, having allied with Poland and they were with uh, against the Teutonic Knights. This, there's a reenactment of this where they were trying to get the grain down the river, but now the Teutonic Knights are 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 have iron chains across the river and guns on the banks and uh, soldiers trying to stop them, and they're fighting the whole way down the river, skirmishing the, like the, for quite a quite a long way from where you are in, in uh, Warsaw to all the way to Dansk. Um, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it's weeks, right? And so they had the game. Mm -hmm. These guys were ready. They were used to the game, and they they pulled it off. They got through. All the chains they 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 fought they blasted their way through the Teutonic uh, ambushes. They had guns on the rafts and everything. Okay. And uh, so, to me, this is a great example of like the game. Like when I, I remember when I, I was researching this, and I showed my wife the Palio, the, the the horse race in Siena. She loved that. Who doesn't? But I showed her the water jousting. Mm -hmm. She said, "That's goofy. Those guys are goofy." And I was like, "Yeah, but this is this is a real martial art too. This 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 silly thing where they're pushing each other off of a raft with a pole." Right. Yeah. Anyway, I, this this yeah. just tapped into a subject that I love. This whole idea of the difference between playing to learn versus uh, following orders and doing as we what you're told. Both of which can work, and both of which are needed sometimes for different kinds of training. Right. But in the Middle Ages, they did the play a lot more for all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that that appears to be very true, and we only we are only starting to actually understand that as far as academia goes. Yeah, but one thing more about the codex and its connection to Lichtenauer. So the the basic dichotomy, as as we we told, uh, is the, between the serious and the playful fencing. But there is an important another layer to this because uh, the other thing that the Lichtenauerian system did for the author of the manuscript was that it provided a framework to differentiate between uh, correct and uh, wrong fencing. Because one of, I think, the key the arguments that the author offers is that uh, if you understand Lichtenauerian fencing, then you are able to play in a way that will benefit you in real situations. And if you don't, you will be, you know, free to devolve into whatever silly concepts you are offered by your masters, right? I so, like that. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Okay, so so some of the things he's borrowing from this has been another debate about the nature of Lichtenauer too, which is that, okay. yeah, so that we think that there's fencing elements that are maybe devices. This is how you block. If somebody's trying to hit you, clobber you with a, a cudgel. This is this is a way that you can block it and then counter. But it's not tied into a whole system. Whereas Lichtenauer has this structure where he has the principles of the five words and uh, the ideas 
the, 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 the concepts of timing and, and, and then that's layered, the devices are just our interpretations of that, you know, and, and in fact, when I, I talked to my friend Christian Trostler, who's one of, the, one of our translators, is into English for this, and, you know, as far as he's concerned, a lot of the devices are really, they really are mostly just training, they're training uh, devices to, to help teach you uh, the principles, and that the principles are really the only thing that matters. You know, which is an interesting angle. I'm not sure I yeah, totally it buy seems, that or not. Yeah. But. Yeah, that I think this this is pretty much defendable in the light of the codex. I mean, as far as the author's idea, I think she or he would agree. That's interesting. So this. that so that, that 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 the devices are there more for training than for than for the Ernst or for the situation. Well, I mean, why not both? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, they, they they certainly are a way to develop um, a practical understanding of the principles that are the key. Uh, to the whole thing, and that's why that it's the principles that make Lichtenauer's fencing um, like possible to generalize into whatever system you're pursuing, according to the author. And he actually demonstrates it throughout the codex because the same principles are there applied to other weapons as well as to wrestling, and it's uh, well most of these sections on other weapons are either very brief or incomplete with the the, the sword and buckler section like being a running joke because it generally states that whoever wants to understand how to fight with sword and buckler should understand that and that's the, that's the whole section <laughs> uh right so he didn't, he didn't, he, so we that's never like the, that's like the xxx in your manuscript you know where you're gonna you meant to go back and right. flex that out <laughs> <laughs> right, but still, in uh, people usually overlook uh, the wrestling and the dagger section from this manuscript, oh, yeah. and it actually, especially the dagger, contains very interesting lessons on how the principles that are uh, introduced in the longsword section are then, you know, applied to very different scenario where you you know do many things that in the longsword you do with the blade. There you do with your own body, so but it's different, still different, the same thing for the author. Different same principles with different affordances. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's right. That's right. And yeah, and this is this is very interesting to me. Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that makes this manuscript a very interesting one. And I think aren't aren't you one of the people that kind of leans toward the idea that the fencing actually arises from grappling, or maybe the principles come from grappling? Yeah, that's a complicated question, but there are certainly ways to put it that way. I mean, uh, there there are well, you. Uh, the, it's a very general statement, so there is always a way to make it work one way or another, right? But, uh, okay, so that yeah, ties in. That ties in. I two, tend to agree. Two other points. I think Christian, by the way, is going to be delighted that, about the, the idea that the, the devices are 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 really at least as much training devices as fighting devices. And I think it's a very interesting idea. And I know that's something that he's, hopefully he won't be mad at me for outing him on, on uh, maybe, I don't know if he wants it out there, but for the six people that are still listening at this point, <laughs> uh, by the way, um, was having a little trouble with the audio at first, with your audio, and I turned down the bit rate, and I think that seems to have fixed it. So it's a lot clearer now. Uh, so, um, I, we've been at this for a while now. I don't want to keep you up all night, but I, I want to talk. We'll kind of like maybe uh, the, finish the introduction, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do another discussion, and maybe even like a, a panel discussion with a couple other people one day. But I'd like to to delve more into some other things. But to kind of wrap up this idea of your exploration, starting from being a young fencer, and then um, getting into uh, archaeology and finding this very interesting niche. Uh, which I, th I do think is rigorously defended. I, I was very impressed with what little I have read of your, your work, um, not enough of it. But um, there's two things that I think emerged that are really interesting that uh, are, can be highlighted by comparing this, this manual to a much later manual, which is written in a totally different style, and it touches on this issue of the differences between the medieval mindset and the early modern, or, or let's say, Renaissance mindset, um, which is something we've we've discussed briefly a little bit uh, online. But uh, mm -hmm. so when we look at one of my favorite manuals, uh, fight books, I should say, I get I get yelled at uh, 
Yasha and uh, Soriatis tells me never to call them names, but <laughs> that's not the right word. But the, so one of my favorite five books is are, are the, one of my favorite series of five books are the Yach and Meyer ones. And what's wonderful about those is they're so opposite of the early the, the medieval ones in that the medieval ones are a little bit cryptic. They're analogous. They're 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 kind of trying to they're 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 informal. They're trying to teach you by um, you know to tap into your intuition. And in my opinion. I don't know what you think about this, but I, I always feel that the medieval systems are, I, they're trying to describe a very dynamic system that's always ready to be reconfigured in a lot of different ways. Whereas in later periods, especially once you get down into the Mediterranean, uh, it's a little more rigid. It's very much, very much more explicit. And it, it's written in a way, in, in a, it is written like a little bit more like a manual, like a modern manual. And they're equally challenging. So we're reading Jochen Meyer. He spells out everything. You could read it. Anybody, can, anybody with a reasonable education could read a page from Jochen Meyer and understand every single thing he's saying. It's just that it, it covers a lot. It's complicated. I can also read the manual for how to maintain a nuclear reactor, but it doesn't mean I'm going to be able to do it because it's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, 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 or even to fix my car it might be a better analogy. You know, um, not that good at that. But... It's a word. It's wordier. It's more explicit. We actually have geometry that's written out and drawn in the images. Um, whereas I, I believe I, I read something you had, that you had written that I thought was very an interesting insight because it, it echoes something I think. And I don't only think people's insights are good when they agree with me, but uh, in this case, uh, it, it, it was something I also have come to the same conclusion, which mm -hmm. is that the geometry. Well, how more broad? We'll start broad and, and then narrow down to specifics. The, Broadly, uh, there's a lot of similarities, really, it seems like, between 32.7a and, and Meyer in cer from certain angle in the sense that Meyer as well, I think, this is another debate, but I believe that Meyer, in looking at the various weapon systems in his, in his fight books, uh, especially the 1570, which I, is the one I'm most familiar with, he he uses he uses the different weapons in, a, in a, as a pedagogical devices to so that each one exaggerates the fight in a different way. So when you're fighting with a dagger, it, it it's the close work, it's a lot of the grappling, and when you're fighting with a pike or a, you know long staff or something, mm -hmm. that, that's the long distances. And but it's he's it's they are different expressions of the same system. There's a big running debate about the fact that in in Yakamaya the thrusting is is all in the rapier section. He doesn't really have that much as much thrusting, uh, arguably, in the longsword section, and he talks about that explicitly. And to me, this he just found that the rapier was like a better place to put it in terms of like teaching how to do things, and, as well as the fact that in the festschul of his day in the Schulfechten, they may not have liked a lot of thrusting, but um, and even maybe in some of the Ernst. But okay, so to specific questions: A. Uh, do you see the geometry, the, the same geometry that we see in the, uh, let's say, the Italian and Iberian manuals and in Jochen Meyer and some other uh, Central European ones, where we literally have, you know, arcs and angles and, and lines written out on the, on the uh, page and circles on the, on the uh, page, is, do you still see that, art, that geometry implicit in the earlier uh, 3227A, which has such a different style? Is he really describing the same thing uh, very clearly and with the same level of, of mastery? Um, and in general, well, let's start with that, and then I'll, I'll have a follow-up on that. Okay, yeah, fun. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I actually have a, have a section on this in the dissertation, but... That's uh, probably where I got the idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, 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 short, the short answer is that if you put uh, the, the devices from uh, manuscript 3227A into practice, uh, geometry, uh, well, uh, an understanding of geometrical relations and how they form the environment of combat implicitly emerges from, from practice, right? I mean, it's, it's implicitly there. It's never spelled out. The word geometry never appears in the manuscript. Uh, but it sort of shines through certain metaphors that are used there, especially the famous, uh, well, like a string connecting the point to to the opening. Oh, he says that? This I is uh, like, I yeah, okay. yeah, he does. So that's uh, well, a geometrical metaphor, like par excellence, so to say. And that's exactly if you how, come to think about it. That's how artisans measured angles was with string. That's another, you know, like, 
that's true or distance right uh, yeah i yeah. saw i saw a video once on showing how in the, you know the, what's the name of the castle that they're building in france where they they were showing how they were i the keep forgetting correct. yeah mm -hmm. they were showing how they're making the angles correct uh in the in the sta a spiral staircase with a piece of string and it was like this you know little masonic trick that and by, by which i mean the artisan type of mason uh to just get the angle right which boy you you cannot screw up if you're making a you know doing engineering right Absolutely. yeah <laughs> Yeah. Right, true. Yes. Yeah. So a short okay. answer is yeah, geometry is there implicitly, but uh, yeah, it it's very easy to overlook, and actually it's been overlooked for a while by not only Hema people but also mm, scholars who used like five books cursorily to make an argument about uh, history of sport or history of physical culture, broadly speaking. Uh, right, but. Uh, it only becomes apparent if you pay close attention to the kind of uh, objectives that uh, fencing techniques want you to achieve and uh, yeah, the affordance landscape that they assume when you do these things and actually put these things in motion, try to replicate the sort of actions or the experiments that are written down in the fight book, then you you will quickly notice that geometry is uh, a crucial part of it because without certain geometrical principles, the the, the whole thing quickly fall, falls apart. Yeah, I, I would almost describe like one of the things that's happened to me, unfortunately, is that I have been, you know, middle age, medieval literature is full of uh, viruses, and one of them affected me, which was the Galenic four humors concepts, and I, mm -hmm. I would say that the um, the the medieval manuscripts are written in a little bit more like a uh, almost like a sanguine point of view, uh, where where they're 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 confident, they're they're expecting you to follow analogies, they're expecting you to use your intuition to follow what they're saying. Whereas the later manuals, say Jakob Meyer or you know pick your Italian fencing manual, most of them anyway, uh, are written a little bit more melancholic, where it's it's very meticulous, very detailed. It's a lot more space in between each idea. But to me, when I was learning fencing, and I, I am nowhere, even at my my best, I was nowhere anywhere near as good of a fencer as, as you from what I've seen in videos. But uh, so I don't want to compare that. But and, and my, I, I was very crude, you know. I mean, it was uh, like a lot of Americans. But I managed to make it work. And I remember somebody, you know, just showing me once or telling me, reading to me, you know, excerpts from the settle, which is what got me to start really looking at manuals first. So this is way back in like 2006 or something, and. Um, how to properly do a, a Zornhau uh, and how to do an Absetzen. That was a big one for me, was to, to do a, like an Ox Absetzen or a Flug Absetzen. And I just read the description and I just wanted to try it. And I told my friend, you know, go hit me in the head. I put a mask on and that's that Absetzen, or, you know, and same thing with the Zorn play. There's a lot of geometry there. The geometry has to be just right. Mm -hmm. But just from the few, the e economical words, the few words that uh, I picked up, and that I just sort of thought I got it, you know. And like I'm, a, I'm very much like that. I'm a sanguine guy, you know. I like to, I'm a bon vivant, and I, and I, I use intuition a lot, and it, it works a lot. Sometimes it works. It, sometimes it fails, and I thought it worked, so that's catastrophic. But when it's working, mm -hmm. it, it it gets me past a lot of other study, and I, I was able to get, bang, an assets into work. And I've caught the other guy's blade, and I got my point in his face, and I got that to work like just from that moment. Whereas figuring it out from one of these longer manuscripts, where uh, let's say maybe maybe I was coming at it a little bit more from a, what what an artisan would be, you know, uh, uh, just some some metalwork, yeah. you know. Where, that, where, that's actually interesting. Versus a Point. university trained guy, you know, who, who would want really need to. But in both cases, I think we can see the presence of Euclid is there. The presence of Vitruvius is there. Um, sure. So, all right, my last question. Oh, yeah, so it, oh, no, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, just one remark because uh, when you mentioned the differences between like how between how content is presented in like medieval works and the early, the early modern ones, there's clearly a difference. And what what many people seem to overlook is that in the early medieval uh, early modern period they have already embraced like collectively the medium of writing, whereas the late Middle Ages is very much uh, 
time where they like fuck around and find out how this whole thing works. Uh, and it's already established pretty well by others, well, focusing specifically on literacy, mm -hmm. that uh, late medieval writings uh, are often, you know, really crude attempts at converting oral the testimonies or oral transmission into writing. Whereas in early modernity, they already figured that out and they like developed a specific, like, you know, written talk, mm -hmm. a very different kind of elaborating concepts and presenting content that's specifically meant to be written down. Yes, and yeah, especially yeah. the, yeah, and manuscript is a perfect example. And many scholars before me like noticed this, uh, Ellert and Lang, which uh, who, who investigated the cooking recipes there in the 1980s, I think it, they already the, noticed that the, the cooking, it seems to be capturing. You mean the cooking? Yeah, the cooking in recipes 32, in 3237A. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. precisely. So they already noticed that that the whole manuscript seems to be capturing stuff that's has that's, that that had previously circulated orally, and it's probably in many cases, the first written account of these things that we know of, right? And uh, the, the fencing content is no different. As I told you earlier today, there's clearly the author was not entirely sure whether they should like capture what someone is telling them or perhaps just, you know, write it down exactly as they would tell these things or try to modify it you know, to be more intelligible for uh, for a reader rather than listener. Right. Okay. So this actually ties right. in with my second question. So I, I took it a pretty deep, for me by my standards. I took a deep look at, at this this whole concept of uh, the the changes in in literature. I was trying. I I, I wrote a bunch of little uh, blog posts on Harar like you know twenty years ago or something, or fifteen years ago, about this and. Um, trying to analyze how literature changed and so like the, just the basic venn diagram of fight books are people who can are interested or you know sword fighting for, and then it can read right so that it's it's a combination of those things and as as i'm i don't need i know you know this but like for anybody else that's still listening the idea is that there's this there are these very formal changes that happen in the way books are written so which was sometimes called late manuscript culture uh, and then that became even more formalized when we get into printed books. But the idea of things like chapter headings and another thing that's kind of gone away now, mm -hmm. which is like little summaries of what's going to be in a chapter and having page numbers in certain places and using certain scripts and, um, and, and limiting uh, subjects into specific chapters and not bouncing around all over and things like that. So there was a formalized style of writing that was designed more for because there's an intermediate, there's this, there's the speaking, you know, talking to a student or talking to your, your instructor, or your master versus then there's another version of it where you're somebody's reading, but they're reading out loud for a group of people. And then there's a later version, which is really for reading by yourself. Uh, from what I understand. Uh, and so and th these are different permutations of manuscript culture, which I, I personally believe has a lot to do with the proliferation of paper. Because once once you got a paper mm -hmm. mill in your town, like Nuremberg is the first proven paper right. mill north of the Alps, but we have so all the Polish cities got uh, the big Polish cities got paper mills and then printing presses pretty early. And one of these things is one of the the characteristics of the 15th century is the really really rapid spread of the printing press. And every town that got a printing press already had a paper mill. I've learned from looking at at least all the ones that have you know if you look at the big map of all the Incunabla and the ones that have a lot of uh, of ink and novel, which are printed, as you know, are printed books that were finished before 1500. So um, my question is that, yes, they did make a more, obviously they made a more formal way to write and, and to transmit knowledge in, in literature, in books, in the 16th century. Uh, did they, did, did, did we maybe lose something? And, and can we really say that the medieval approach and the medieval thinking um, because let's say the, the early modern approach is very specific. It's very it's a very specific way. It's a lot it's a lot wordier. Do we need that mm -hmm. really? 
Uh, do we need all the charts and the diagrams, or can you still transmit the same knowledge with poems and, and innuendos and, and allegories? Uh, and is the medieval system really, or the medieval think, way of thinking, let's say the late medieval, because this is certainly a unique thing of, the, of that time of like, you know, 14th, 15th century, is it actually cruder and less sophisticated or is it a different, just different and is it like a different way to, to uh, look at problems? And because what I think I see, and you may disagree with this, this is, this is just a guess, uh, but it does look to me that some of the 16th and especially like by the time you get to the 17th century manuals and later, um, they're, they're a little more rigid in how, in how they're telling you to do things. And it's not quite like what I see in the in something like 327A, the limited amount that I can understand it, and other manuals from the 15th century is is uh, very dynamic systems. And and the way it's instructed, Christian Trosker and I have a running joke that medieval Germans are like current Italians and vice versa. You know, because when you're reading the Italians, they're very rigid and explaining everything is just this mm -hmm. way and that way. And all the German fight books are, well. You know, swing it this way, and if he's tall, he might have to do it a little higher. Or you know, if he in it, you go f just react to what he does, and if he's pushing, you know, maybe you go to the other side. But it's very, it's very, it's it's very open ended. It seems like, whereas the Italians are much more like, you know, you're gonna you're gonna cut a fendente on the left, and then you're gonna, do, you know, what I mean, like it's more specific. So maybe speak to that just right. for a second. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I. I have very limited knowledge on uh, of Italian fencing, so I won't comment on that. But well, from my to Meyer, um, say. right, yeah. So if I, even if I compare uh, manuscript three two two seven eight to later National Iron fight books like uh, von Danzig, for instance, or Ringer, what strikes me is that uh, the manuscript is seems to be rather to well to convey its teachings rather by setting objectives to achieve, whereas the later fight books provide you with the exact solution. So they try to codify the action, whereas the codex tries to codify the, the setting and the goals that you want to achieve more than the particular motions. And this actually is quite in line with what other scholars find out um, researching literacy and the changes in this particular time frame that is between the 14th and 15th century. In the four, uh, 14th century, the literacy is just like at the very beginning in Central European towns. In the 15th century, it's already like rapidly developing. Yeah. And uh, the changes that they observe in very like broad strokes speaking in broad strokes, the changes that they see is that um, as the literacy progresses, there is a tendency to start codifying things in like um, making canons, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the, the early li literature is focused on presenting things as they are, the later are more focused on presenting them as they should be, so to say. Mm. So they are less descriptive in a sense and more prescriptive, and they all they are also more rigid in yeah. what they uh, what they preserve, right? So this would fit, in my opinion, the differences between, say, von Danzig and manuscript three to the seven a. So that's one one thing, and the other thing is connected to um, how uh, how the the early sources work and how they connect to the practices or the knowledge that they were meant to preserve. And the the thing that was eye opening for me was uh, was a lecture that I attended by an anthropologist working with uh, folk tales. And what she told us, and especially uh, she she worked especially with uh, like modern traces of medieval uh, folk tales. Uh, yeah, yeah. And what's uh, what she pointed out is that when we nowadays when we come 
across a medieval source noting down, say, the Red Riding Hood story, right? Because it was known in the Middle Ages. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's very short and it's very like blunt. It's mm -hmm. boils right. down to okay, there was a girl. She went there. She was eaten by a wolf. There came a huntsman and he would like do this or that. Yeah. It's like a ju just a, just a very very well rough description of the narrative arc. Uh -huh. uh, and when we read modern like children's books with the same tale, it's like more elaborate. The characters are more fleshed out. The story is much longer. Like there are more details about the woods, about the grandma's house, all this kind of stuff. And then... now, what she pointed out uh -huh. is not that the old. Um, and this is based on the work with uh, like present traditional folk storytellers and recordings of, uh, for, for instance, from 1960s of like the very, very traditional elderly storytellers back then. Uh -huh. What she noted is that people who are used to operate in the oral tradition, uh, for them, it is obvious that the text of a tale and its performance are two separate things. Yeah. And the performance only happens at the junction between the storyteller and the audience. And the tale is oh, never well. actually the same because you, you modify the tale every time you meet a new audience because you see that perhaps they will be, you know, interested in this or that detail or and not so yeah, much yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, in definitely. others. So you skip that part, you elaborate oh, another. So, so much, when but... Yeah, I love that because that's exactly what I do for my talks. Like when I used to go, I, I, I still occasionally, I'm going to go, we'll do one in October. But when I would do talks at university or at a HEMA event, I, at one point I was doing them 16th century style where I was, you know, making very right. elaborate script. And I realized different audiences, you know, they like if you if, if I'm going to, uh, at one point I did a, a few of these in, in, in New England in a very, let's say very hyper liberal area in a college town in a, in a university and that audience does not like the kind of jokes that hemo people like <laughs> if, I, if I'm, I'm sitting right. in front of a bunch of fencers who have already have a covered in bruises and they've let they've let go of their uh, mm. their uh, you know their their pretensions because they've had it beaten out of them they're they're gonna laugh at certain things that um, uh, grad students and college kids at, in uh, in New England are right be grimly silent for so what i've learned to do for mine is that i make i make very very minimal bullet points to remind me of what not to miss so i don't forget because i can wing it wing it but like i might forget a key thing so i just put the little bullet points and then i tailor it to the audience you know and that right that's a great analogy for what, what the, the differences that i think i see with the fight books too I right. Like so what that professor found during her, her field work was that when she tried to when she recorded these elderly storytellers, asking them to just present the tale, she would get this very, very limited, like, you know, just a skeleton of a story. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas while recording them performing these stories for an audience that they cared for, then was where the fleshed out story would appear right so what we have in terms of medieval um folk tales what's preserved in the sources is usually just like the skeleton the abstract of the tale yeah yeah right and There's we no, can't no, get the actual performance it. because it's forever lost yeah right, it's right. been never recorded right yeah you know um and in, no one would actually in, in deutsche mythology um jacob Grimm talks about this too i think uh he, he he referred because this this is one of the issues they were grappling with when they were making you know they did this big survey as, as I'm sure you know all about it but of all the mythology they could figure out not just really Germany but all over Central Europe and you know uh, and then they were going to convert those to the fairy tales that in America everybody thinks Brothers Grimm fairy tales are, are so grim they think Grimm is like the mm -hmm. descriptor not the name of the guys but really those are very softened but they're also made they're also a little bit more and I, the Grimm brothers are probably less guilty of this, and this maybe is why, why they get in trouble. Uh, but like, you know, some of the others in Denmark and, and France, and you know, um, you, when you when you go from the medieval period to the later periods, you get a lot more of the devils behind all the uh, 
like the goblins and the fairies and stuff, they're all working for the devil. In the Middle Ages, it's not like that. Mm-hmm. They're, it, they're, the characters are very slippery. You know, like yeah, you maybe want to be careful with the leshy because uh, you know if you if you get on his wrong side, he could send a hundred bears and a snowstorm on you. But uh, if you put your shoes on backwards mm-hmm. and then like maybe you leave him a nice uh, a gift of, of a sandwich, you know, he, he might uh, he might give, throw some gold to you or something. You know, so like the it's a, right, it's a right. much more nuanced, flexible. Uh, in a, in a mm-hmm. moral sense too, uh, the kind of story you know that's that's another interesting aspect of it to me. Uh, wow, that's great! I love that insight. Um, we have to exchange some links after this. Uh, so look, this has been going on for a while now, and I don't want to keep you till all night long. But uh, uh, Magic, thank you so much for coming and uh, and doing. You're this welcome. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was a great pleasure for me. It's, and I've been really wanted looking forward to this and wanted to do it for a long time with you and. Uh, yeah, I hope we can have some other conversations, uh, you know, in the future, and maybe we can get some more people too uh, at some point. I do my best. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. the work the work will allow. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we don't have to rush it, uh, but if if it, if, it, if the if the clouds part, maybe it'll happen. And uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll look forward to, uh, you know, corresponding with you and so on. And is there any last things that you would like to say before we uh, wrap it up? No, I think that would be. Yeah, just perhaps the, the connection that perhaps manuscript 3 to the 7 a or similar sources are more, you know, emerging from this oral tradition that's very, that's still struggling with the written medium, right? And that's why it's so different from the others. That's yeah. the thing to consider. And that, that's, that's, that's the point I wanted to make at the, at the end. And okay, I, so know. would you agree maybe that, that the way that seemed to become the consensus on how to adapt that was probably one of several options, and maybe in not every sense the best option. I mean, did we? Do you think maybe we lost a little something in making going across that threshold? Uh, well, no. From a historian's perspective, the the early modern way is generally better because it provides you with more data points, right? But yeah, at the same time, we perhaps lost something along the way um but it's very hard to actually judge what it was and how much of it was lost yeah my one of my so, yeah so so yeah go, go ahead no i mean i just wanted to say that it's it's a very complex question it's hard to you know it has to be investigated on a case-by-case basis and in most of those cases you would probably you know never know really I think to me this is a subset of a bigger issue for me that um, it's just the the idea that when when we turned our back on the medieval period, I feel like that all the medieval knowledge kind of went through a very narrow funnel in the late eighteenth century with the French Revolution and all that, and, and it had already been right, yeah. you know, being it was already being eroded all through the Baroque period, and I think we we really threw a lot of uh, babies out with that bathwater. And lot, I think in general, we lost a lot because I think this medieval culture has a lot to teach us about all kinds of things. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's becoming more and more visible nowadays. Yeah. And that's one of the things that keeps motivating me to, you know, do this kind of research. Yeah. Well, it's appreciated. Because I, I see the present relevance of this. Yeah, me too. And that that's something that I would like to talk about in the future is, is, is some of that aspect of it, uh, of what I think a little bit in, in my country anyway I see that people are a little bit starved for ideas they're sort of like we have these rehash of enlightenment ideas that have been uh, you know sort of adjusted by propaganda and ideology uh, you know in the intervening periods and um, there's where we are in the United States struggling a little bit with our political system and making it work and and with our culture and making that work and all that and I think I think there's so one of the interesting things about the medieval period is final thought is there's because there's so many polities and 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 in places like Poland where they they had such a loose way of managing like there's so many different communities that were like look if you're with us when we go to war uh you know you contribute a little bit to the taxes you know how you want to run it is up to you uh that was how the holy roman empire was too really and you know and sure. mm-hmm. were, were, did were the germans better off when they became a lot more tightly organized and i mean speaking as somebody with family in france it wasn't good for the neighbors, you know. <laughs> like maybe, maybe this looser thing 
Might, might have some benefits, but at the very least, it gives us a lot of sli slightly different examples, you know, just like we have with the fight books. They're all a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also the truth. It's also the case with a lot of times how these communities were managed and how and, and, some, and often self-managed and, and, and what the cultural uh, sort of rules were and, and, and things like that. There's, uh, there's commonalities, obviously, but there was also a lot of variation. You know, and I think yeah, that's, that's perfectly true. So it's it's a large repository of very different solutions to uh, problems that are sometimes quite familiar to us now. Yeah, and that's why I think I agree with you that this is something that is often too easily and too quickly, well, brushed aside and forgotten, yeah. and well worth reconsidering in many respects. Not yeah, to well, repeat it, but to like uh, you know learn the lessons. Right, and we have a we have it's a lot of it's a lot of empirical studies. That's the way I try to explain it to a friend of mine, who's a political uh, uh, professor, who's like exactly. It, it's it's as if somebody you know, like you were saying, you did a long term study on 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 moving in the ways of this thirty two seven eight. Well, these people did long term studies on trying some different uh, political balancing of you know organizing different communities. Mm -hmm. and we can look at that how that worked over three hundred seventy years or four hundred fifty years or something, and you know. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, precisely. Friend, you've, you've done a lot to thank help you. me understand it, and I really appreciate it. And give my regards to your cat and, and my your pleasure. family. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Cheers. See you.